Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Engaged, How to Get Respondents to Say I Do. I just wanted to come on and let everybody know we're going to wait um, a couple more minutes before we start to let everybody um, just get signed in. So please just hold on about three minutes and then we'll get started. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for joining us today for our webinar, Engaged, How to Get Respondents to Say I Do. So before we get into today's presentation, I just wanted to quickly thank our sponsors for making this happen. Um, thanks to Innovate, they are a global online sampling technology firm generating high quality data from engaged panelists while providing 24-7 client service to thousands of market researchers around the world. And thank you to FuelCycle, an enterprise-grade, SaaS-based online community platform gives brands exactly what they need to know about their customers in real time with 360 degrees of knowledge. So in today's presentation, we will walk you through some techniques and strategies to help keep respondents engaged throughout the entire research life cycle. Wanted to quickly introduce myself. My name is Ashley Wolf. I'm the Senior Marketing Manager here at FuelCycle, and I'm very excited to have you with us all today. Before we start, I have a few housekeeping items. So we will have a Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. So if you have any questions at any time throughout today's webinar, feel free to submit them to either the question or chat box inside the GoToWebinar interface. And I will keep track of them throughout and come back to them at the end of the presentation. And um, today's webinar should take about 25 to 30 minutes. 
Um, and then we will go into a 10 to 15 minute Q&A session. So with that, I would like to introduce our pre presenters. Lisa Wildly Brown is Innovate's Chief Research Officer. She has played a pivotal role in helping to shape industry standards through extensive research on research initiatives. Also, recently, in addition to her research background, Lisa leads the industry's first committee focused exclusively on user engagement. Thank you for joining us today, Lisa. Rick is Fuel Cycle's in-house expert on insights and customer experience. He has spent most of his career in the market research industry, working closely with clients and operations teams to ensure clients' needs are met. Recently, in addition to his research background, Rick is now a member of the CX at Rutgers program. Thank you for joining us today, Rick. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to you, Lisa. Thanks so much, Ashley, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just absolutely thrilled to be co-presenting this webinar with Rick. Uh, you know, I think to get things kicked off, uh, I'll mention here, people who know me well or work with me know that I like to use dating analogies when describing our industry's relationship with respondents. And Rick and I have had a lot of different discussions about sort of the state of the union, and we think our industry's relationship is in need of some serious couples therapy. So we're going to talk a little bit about what the current dynamic looks like, and also we're going to get into, you know, all the various parallels between managing the respondent experience and, of course, you know, courting a respondent. We'll be reviewing the various stages of building up what is really meant to be a healthy relationship. And then later on, Rick will walk us through some real use cases on what effective and respectful respondent engagement looks like. And then at the end, we'll be taking some questions. Okay, so first things first. We have to ask ourselves the question, do we have a healthy relationship with respondents in this space? Do we respect and communicate well with the average respondent? We can all agree that there is a lot of work to be done, and our current relationship with respondents is lacking. So what does that look like? Well, simply put, it is a rather unhealthy relationship that we have with respondents. And some might say we're on the verge of a bad breakup. And so what's going on in the space that's sort of contributing to that unhealthy relationship? First off, a little metric that a lot of panel companies don't talk about openly, but I want to talk about today, is conversion rate. Did you know that on average, most panels have a conversion rate anywhere between 5% on the low end and 10 to 15% on the high end? That means that about 90% of the time, respondents are not qualifying for our surveys. And that can be related to a lot of things. It can be connected to the fact that a lot of the survey inventory in our space is particularly low incidence. So it's no fault of our own. But also, there I think is a desire to improve the targeting that a lot of panels are doing today. And we can all agree that there is some poor targeting that's taking place, not using the information, not communicating that information the right way so that we really match up the right respondent with the right survey at the right time. In conjunction with this conversion rate debacle, we also have a serious issue on our hands when it comes to CPIs. There has been overwhelming compression of CPIs over the years, and this really yields to a lower standard. There's you know, incentives continue to get squeezed because of that lower CPI compression, and that means respondents are earning less over time and are becoming frustrated with their experience. We also know that there's some design issues with surveys. We see a lot that there's problems with, you know, over quotas uh, leading to a bad experience. Uh, you know, I think also with the over quotas, there's design issues with long grids, longer surveys. The average survey in our space is anywhere between 25 and 30 minutes, so it's not mobile friendly. Um, and it's requiring quite a great commitment for a pretty low incentive, because it's all correlating back to that CPI, and if sample companies are not earning enough, they're certainly not giving a high incentive to respondents. And the other piece, too, to speak on, you know, what is, what is going on that's creating this unhealthy relationship is are we getting greedy with data? Are we asking too many questions? Are we asking questions that aren't necessary? Now, it's challenging for market research companies as well as end clients on the corporate side because they're often managing many, many constituents within an organization, and so everyone, to get, everyone wants to get their questions in. But I'm urging the industry really to take a hard look at the questions that do make it into a survey and really ask yourself if you are designing that survey, do I need this question? 
uh, am I asking it for both a mobile as well as de desktop uh, audience? And you know, the key here and the point I want to drive home is that there's really a lack of personal touch among many of the industry's panel. And we know that that's really an element that is at the heart of every healthy relationship. So none of this is new news. We aren't listening and we're not making changes. And the trouble is, is that we can't have our cake and eat it too. Uh, it's a really, you know, serious issue that's having a real impact on the performance and overall contributions of the market research space. So what does the fallout look like and how does it really affect us? Panels have a very high lapse rate. The average lifetime completions among panelists are very low, high attrition rates. And ultimately, because of that conversion rate I was speaking about earlier, that 10% average conversion, we're conditioning poor behaviors, right? So if I'm making it very difficult for respondents to qualify due to lack of targeting, lack of you know, utilization of data, uh, or very low incidence populations that I'm trying to sort of fit into the survey, uh, then we're actually conditioning respondents to behave poorly. We're making it so challenging them for, to, to qualify for a survey that they're starting to tell us what they think we want to hear. And, you know, in conjunction with all that, we're seeing lower response rates and even negative noise on some of the consumer brands that sponsor these studies. You know, if a respondent takes a survey that's branded to a particular, say, for example, CPG company, and they have a negative experience due to poor design or poor user experience, they're going to now correlate that negative experience with the brand itself who's sponsoring the survey. So really, the very relevancy of market research is threatened, especially as new technologies uh, are surfacing, whether it's passive metering or you know um, AI, as an example, these can all have an impact on our market share. And so it's really important for us to refocus our efforts on the respondent experience. So sorry is not enough. Sometimes you actually have to change. This is really the impetus for this webinar. It's about creating a dialogue and creating an increased focus on the respondent experience. You know, the industry itself has been reporting on user experience for years at conferences, company blogs. There's been a tremendous um, effort on research on research. Uh, and I'm happy to say I think we're gaining some momentum. There's some new consortiums that have been forming. Um, as Ashley mentioned at the top of the hour, we have the Insights Association is sponsoring the online sampling forum that I'm helping to co-chair, as well as the GRBN, which is putting together a really strong global initiative to look at user experience. So I'm very excited about some of the momentum that that we're, we're gaining here, but I encourage you know folks on the phone, if you're interested, definitely reach out to us. We'd love to get you involved as well. So again, back to the dating parallel. I really see it breaking off into three different areas. You have the wink, or what I like to call the first impression. This is you know when you're onboarding panelists into your community. And then you have the date, or really what is the survey, the typical quantitative or even qualitative survey, and the type of impression that you're making during that experience. And then the third piece is all about going steady, maintaining and growing that sample universe, keeping folks engaged, through an increase in awareness and collaboration. And I think it's important to mention that this webinar is really not just intended for sample managers or panel managers, but really it's about getting that dialogue going among all the different stakeholders in the research ecosystem. Whether you are a panel manager, I definitely think this is going to be of interest for you. But if you are a researcher, I've got some tips and tricks from a research design standpoint that I think can really help contribute to stronger surveys that yield a better experience. And of course, on the end client, corporate brands, the ones that are sponsoring all the research and keeping the lights on, per se, it's important to have this dialogue and give you visibility and provide transparency on some of the challenges that our industry is facing. So let's talk about the first one, the wink. The first impressions are absolutely everything. And it's really about listening and learning from respondents. So as you're onboarding new, new folks into your panel, don't be complacent. Don't think that, hey, I've built my reg path and now I'm done. It's about iterating on that and using the different feedback mechanisms that you have in place to capture feedback on what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong and not being afraid to iterate on that and leveraging the resources that are available to you to really create the best first impression possible. And one thing that's really important with creating first impressions is setting expectations through you know, solid communication that's very short and very concise. And you can have those communicative um, elements through things like an FAQ, a terms of use, and of course privacy policy so that people really understand what you're doing, what you're looking to seek when you interview them, um, and how you're using their information and what's in it for them. 
and it's about too in, in creating an engaging user experience and being smart with the data that you capture. Um, you know, I think that's an area that we we can really create some momentum on. Um, there's a lot of panels out there and communities out there that will re-ask the same data point over and over and over again, and that's because those relational databases are not relational. They're not using the data on a longitudinal basis to sort of put a story together on what that respondent profile looks like. So it's really key that we balance our appetite for data with the time that we're asking respondents to invest and explore ways to capture that data in a very iterative way. And I think the other piece too is about creating relevancy for the respondent and treating the respondent as a person, not as quote unquote sample, right? So asking them questions and understanding what makes them uniquely, you know, tick in the situation so that you can serve them up with the right opportunity at the right time. And really ask yourself, what is your value proposition? What is it, what's in it for the respondent? And really make sure that you're laying that out in a very simple and clear way. So part two, the date. Uh, this is where we get into really what I see as the date of user experience, the survey itself. Um, you know, there's some tips and tricks here, and certainly this is not 100% comprehensive. There's been a lot of research on research that's been done through the years on how to develop and create a, a solid questionnaire that, you know, helps you achieve your goals, but also keeps respondents engaged. But I do want to talk about some key things from my perspective that I've seen over the last, call it 15 years in the industry. Question redundancy continues to be an issue where, depending on the flow that the user takes, they may answer the same exact question multiple times, whether it's pre-screening on behalf of the sampling company or the client re-asking re that same question in the survey. Find ways to use data to you know, shorten the experience and be smart with the data that you collect. Design is another key piece. Using non-leading questions is super, super important, but unfortunately I still see a lot of surveys today that are quite leading in nature. So things to avoid like yes-no formats. It sounds simple. You think you've got the audience member that you want for your, your particular survey, but if you present a yes-no format in the screener, it's quite leading for respondents to figure out that more than likely if they select yes, they'll probably qualify for the survey. And these are still human beings at the end of the day, good, bad, and ugly. The third point here is writing for a fifth grader. I know it sounds trite, but it actually works wonders. There's a lot of surveys out there that are just far too complex, have really complex vocabulary, and some meaning can get lost along the way. So if you write very simply and very clearly, you can make sure that you're mitigating for that risk of folks not always understanding what you're trying to ask them. Think about designing a survey mobile primary, and then secondary for desktop. If you go with that approach, you're really going to develop a survey that caters to a wide spectrum of individuals and not just those that are on their desktop, because truly that's an issue with representation uh, and overall data quality. And think about the look and feel. Simple things like long grids. Is there a way to sort of compress that into a different question format so visually it looks more appealing to respondents? And again, I go back to that point of making sure that you really exercise discipline here and ask yourself, do you really need to ask that question? And, you know, and show some discipline on that front and maybe think of ways to compartmentalize the questions into different surveys so that the experience itself isn't too arduous or too cumbersome for respondents. And the last piece here is rewarding properly. And this is for all the panel managers on the phone that are listening in. It's really key that you reward properly, that you put together a good reward platform that really incentivizes users long term and produces good quality data long term as well. So the third piece is what happens after you're done with your survey research, going beyond. And you have to ask yourself the question, did you follow through? Did you do what you said you were going to do when you were first developing this community? Or are you cutting corners? And are you listening to respondents? Um, if you're getting feedback that a design that you've put in place, say for example on the registration path, isn't working, are you working to iterate towards that and change those things? Uh, I think complacency is key in making sure that you leverage the various resources that are available to you through your development team or through your budgetary team to make sure that you're really building the best community possible. And you know, building out a rewards system, like I mentioned earlier, that works. And, and I think that this is super key. Obviously, respondents are taking surveys because they want to share their feedback and provide insight, but also they're in it to earn rewards. And so you really have to be clear with yourself on, on what it is you're asking respondents to do and incentivize them based on the time and commitment that you're asking them to contribute to your research. 
and where possible I would highly recommend offering direct rewards versus a sweepstakes and, and I know Rick you're going to speak a little bit about this but sweepstakes from my perspective and all the research that I've conducted in the past is really an, an amazing supplement but at the same time it is cannot be your sole approach to incentivization and don't forget of course to spotlight good behavior as members are doing good things uh, of course you get their permission first but it's a great way to sort of showcase um, you know that respondents are behaving well and it's a great way to build community and really think about being smart with your data management understand what data you're collecting when you're collecting it and how you're using it and who you're sharing with it uh, you know need to make sure that you understand all the nuances related to privacy management and reach out to the various resources that are available in the space if you're not sure and think about the entire life cycle of a respondent, what the experience is from start to finish, and I'll also definitely leverage social channels to help on that front as well. Rick, did you have something to say? No, other than I agree with you completely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, amen to that. Yeah, so the last point I was going to make here is, you know, the social channels being really key. It just really helps to develop a sense of community. It helps get your panel brand, and ultimately, if it's a community focused on a particular brand or genre, uh, you know, gets, gets visibility. So having a presence on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, things like that are really vital to help spread the message. And so... The last thing I'll, I'll say before I pass it on to, to Rick is that, and I love this graphic, and anyone that knows I am a huge dog lover, we have two ears and one mouth for a reason, so we can talk less and listen more. And it's really our hope that others will join us in doing their part to make the respondent experience a better one, because I can do what I can do here at Innovate, but it's a sample universe that is limited. And everything we're doing, every action we take across all the different companies in the space has an impact on people's perception of survey research. So it's really important that we get collaboration across the industry. And I know Rick is going to showcase this philosophy that we share in action with some case studies that really help to demonstrate some very innovative brands that are really on the leading edge of this very important issue. So you take it away, Rick. Hey, thanks so much, Lisa. And just to echo a couple of the, the key points that you made, you know, designing for a mobile first world is, is key because, I mean, uh, research goes beyond just our traditional panel research and everything as well and extends to uh, collecting customer data, CX, all those types of things. And for us, like, we've adopted an internal policy where when we're developing wireframes for our new software products that, uh, you know, we, we design mobile first and then, uh, and then desktop just because we know that the modern consumer is uh, – is uh, you know on mobile uh, primarily, and then uh, you know if we can make it work, make it work on mobile, then we'll make it work on desktop as well. Um, and then, so I'm going to go ahead and, like Lisa said, share a few case studies and examples, and really talk about uh, how we can engage respondents and you know share a few examples. And the, and the key thing here is, uh, why does the respondent experience matter so much, right? And so at Fuel Cycle, where we build online communities. The respondent or community member experience is critical because what we're trying to do is we're trying to retain community members for as long as possible to get as much value out of them uh, as we can. And so for that to work and us to be able to deliver on our promise, we have to have a phenomenal respondent experience, which is something we focus on with our platform, our practices, and our guidelines to our clients. So some of the things I'll talk about here are is developing that two-way dialogue, uh, setting expectations, uh, giving back and sharing information with community members, and of course, incentivizing them. Um, so I'll go ahead and start with developing the two-way dialogue. So again, we want people to stay around as long as possible. And that means that it has to be a give and take relationship. As anyone who has ever been in a relationship and to carry on with Lisa's uh, dating analogy, uh, relationships are about give and take, and you have to be able to communicate and share information back and forth. Something that goes only one way uh, isn't likely going to work out, as my high school girlfriend can attest. <laughs> but uh, you know, from our perspective, we know that closing the lead, you know feedback loop leads to richer, more like deeper longitudinal insights to better inform future business decisions. And the result for us has been in following all these practices here that we end up with over 85% of community members logging in multiple times beyond that initial survey. 
I think that's a number that we're very pleased with because we're getting long-term longitudinal insights that we wouldn't get otherwise. And an organization that we work with that does this well is the L, is L, L Magazine. And so what they do is they really foster that uh, long-term relationship by giving community members an opportunity to form their own discussions inside the community, to form connections between each other. And then of course, they engage in very active moderation inside the platform and create a dialogue that exists between not just community members, but between the L brand and those community members as well. Right, so fostering that relationship has been very, very key for them. The second thing that we talked about is setting expectations. And I think Lisa, you did a great job teeing this up where you talk about, uh, you know, telling people how their data is being used, especially when you're trying to have a long-term relationship with a respondent or a community member, uh, you need to tell them what they're getting into, right? So they know what's going to be, you know, coming up for them and, and how they can expect to interact and behave with you in the future. And so from our perspective, uh, you need to be transparent around, you know, privacy policies, around describing how data is being used, and around what type of information you're collecting from people, right? So you can imagine uh, how somebody might feel if they didn't know that they were having being cookied, you know, and having uh, something track the data across the web, and they were going to find it out later, right? Uh, it would lead to a very frustrated server respondent and a lack or loss of trust between our community as market researchers and potential survey respondents. So when they when we provide that transparency and tell them what we're going to do or how we're going to use data we're more likely to keep an engaged respondent over time. Uh, the second thing to talk about is uh, giving back and really giving back to respondents and keep them in the know. So we know that one of the biggest drivers of participation in an online branded community is a deeper connection with a brand that people care about. And so that means that things like sneak peeks or sharing results or kind of taking people behind the scenes uh, or respondent spotlight end up being really, really valuable. Um, so we say like behind the scenes, it's something as simple as saying, hey, by the way, as, a, as an organization conducting this research, we're human too. You know, taking somebody inside your office and showing them what your office is like so you can see that it's actually, we're on a more equal footing than, than you might expect. And then uh, of course, sharing results back with community members. Uh, respondent spotlight uh, can work very well as too. Uh, again, here's an example with L, where they uh, they highlight community members who have participated frequently in the previous month, and they do a little interview with them and give them a platform and a voice to be able to share their story or their you know information about them that other people can interact with and you know respond positively to. Another quick example of the uh, on, on giving back is we worked with a, a global uh, payments organization that uh, was collecting a lot of data, data from executives around the world. And uh, obviously, you know, respondent spotlights didn't work as well there because it's a bunch of executives throughout the world. But what that global payments provider did is they would walk out of a meeting where results had been shared from the community. They'd pin an executive against the wall and just take a quick 30 second video and say, hey, you know, tell us what you talked about. And the executive could say, hey, I just came out of this meeting and we uh, we talked about the results that you, or the, the results of the study that you guys did you know two weeks ago. Uh, we can't share how it's going to impact our business. All I can tell you is that it's given us a lot of food for thought, and we appreciate your feedback and keep it coming. And those types of things allow uh, response to see that they are having an impact on the organization, and they're not uh, not alone. Um, and the fourth thing that we we're going to talk about is the importance of incentives. Right, and uh, so I think we can be really candid about incentives. <laughs> we talk about incentives a lot, and for good reason. And I think it's because whether you're in a B2C community, you're in a B2B community, uh, whether it's financial services, media, CPG, retail, whatever it might be, incentives work across all communities, where even communities where it may be unbranded, or uh, you may have less organic interest, if, for instance, if you were a bank, um, you know, uh, there's, it's hard to draw people into a banking community organically. But incentives do offer 
uh, a consistent point of leverage to encourage participation, right? And so kind of a simplistic model that we have uh, shown up on your screen here is that there's really like a trade-off between like the amount of incentives that you need or the need to incentivize and the exclusivity of your audience, right? And so if you're talking to uh, doctors or, uh, you know, left-handed people with mustaches and mohawks that live in uh, a small town in Texas, right, you need to, you need to incentivize them more in order to get them to participate because they are a, a more of a scarce resource. So if you think about it in terms of, you know, the scarcity of your resource, you want to increase your in incentives in proportion to the scarcity of the resource that you have access to, right? And so incentivizing isn't necessarily, uh, uh, you know, I think we can be, again, very transparent around the need for this, is that it's a way to give back and to thank people for their participation and to make sure that they're receiving value out of their, out of their participation in the community. And two examples here uh, that we have up on the screen is one you'll see the uh, an AIG uh, consumer community, and from our from our research we know that giving respondents choice and how they receive incentives uh, really matters. So in our communities, community members can have up to up to 70 different gift card options, and they're able to select uh, from a multitude of different options, and we know that that has an effect on respondent satisfaction or community member satisfaction with the community over time, right? Another example in sweepstakes, and I, I'm just gonna caveat this real quick with, with to echo Lisa's comment, is that you can't rely on sweepstakes alone to keep a community vibrant over time. Uh, sweepstakes are a great supplement, uh, but in this case, you know, the, the L brand was able to give a sweepstakes giveaway back to community members to thank them for one particular study um, although they offer other forms of uh, participation and, or other forms of incentives as well. And just to summarize, uh, kind of our tips and tricks for engaging respondents is one, um, is to foster that two-way dialogue to make this a conversation rather than uh, completely just extracting results from community members. Number two is to set expectations with community members. Tell them what they're getting into and what the expectation from them is as well. Three is to give back. It's to share results, uh, back them when you can, to give them an insight into how their data is being used. And then fourth is to incentivize them, and to incentivize them in proportion to their scarcity uh, as well. And I think with that, uh, this is a good, good stepping stone on our road to regaining trust and respondents and uh, having an honest and candid you know, conversation around uh, improving research and insights for the future. Well, thank you, Rick. Thank you, Lisa. That was very informative, and I know we have lots of questions coming in from our audience, so I just want to dive right in. So we have our first one comes from Pat, who asks, do you have evidence that direct incentives is cost effective versus a uh, sweepstakes? Lisa, do you want to take this one first? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, there is actually quite a bit of uh, research. In fact, I think some of that's actually published and available online. Um, I know from my own personal experience, I conducted some R and R back in my early days of my career, where we took um, three different opportunities or re rewards that we were offering. First was points-based reward um, that was direct to each respondent who successfully completed the survey. The second was a sweepstakes entry, and I believe at that point we were doing an entry uh, to a $10,000 sweepstakes. And the third one was no reward. And we looked at a very balanced cross-section of our panel, and we actually found that when offered a loan, the sweepstakes and the no reward yielded the same level of cooperation and response. So, uh, like I said earlier, Pat, I think sweepstakes are great as a supplement to help round out your overall reward program, but when offered alone, um, they really don't move the needle, and direct incentives are key, and that's really what respondents come to expect. You know, they're in it to share their feedback and their insight, but if you're asking the respondent to take a 25, 30 minute, and I've seen, I've seen longer surveys than that, if you're asking them to participate in a long survey, um, you really need to, to reward them properly. And, and also speaking to Rick's point, if the audience is, 
you know, depending on the exclusivity or scarcity of that audience, um, you'll need to rethink how much how much you're offering. But rewards really make a difference, um, and they really uh, increase long-term retention. And you know, I think as an industry, it's it's really important for us to kind of keep that dialogue open because I. I feel like again, as as CPIs continue to, to to get compressed as they have over the last few years, it seems like our CFOs are putting more and more pressure on us to cut rewards, and I think that's a really short-term solution, uh, and it produces a very long-term problem for us as an industry. Yeah, and Lisa, just to echo your point, uh, about a year ago we did a similar study where we looked across uh, all communities and broke down the reward you know reward programs into guaranteed or direct rewards. Uh, sweepstakes or otherwise, and uh, you know, from our perspective, we found that you know, the, by far the most effective reward program is direct rewards, and then uh, sweepstakes and no rewards were in a similar uh, yield a similar response rate and participation rate over time. Mm -hmm. And I think too, if you if you have a limited budget, you can get creative, um, you know, with the sweepstakes. I think a general sweepstakes isn't as appealing if it's being offered across multiple survey engagements, and the perception is that you know my chances of winning aren't really high. But doing kind of branded sweepstakes that are specific to the survey, I think, are definitely putting your best foot forward to get that response rate, even if you are operating under a very tight budget, which I know a lot of clients um, are facing. So kind of a branded sweepstakes that you know is specific or the prize itself is specific to the audience that you're looking to reach definitely will resonate better than a more generalized one. Yeah, and, and sweepstakes are part of the puzzle too, right? Like it's, it's not, when we talk about developing a, a good respondent experience in the community environment or context, uh, sweepstakes or incentives are, are a portion of the conversation, but it's also very key that we you know, give back, that we share information mm -hmm. around how the community is being used. And so some balance of those variables uh, ends up yielding like the, the right participation rate over time. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Great. Well, we had another question come in from Philip, which I think is um, for Rick. But what keys have you seen to re-engaging inactive members? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. I think uh, one, uh, there's, we can have an expectation around calibrating like our own expectations for, for re-engaging people. And this, this kind of goes back to getting the respondent experience right the first time around is that that's very key. Um, we know from experience on our end that offering direct rewards uh, can be very effective in regaining uh, lapsed community members. Um, but also, uh, you know, reaching out and doing a, a quick survey with them um, will help give you insight, right? So uh, doing a quick survey for people who have not participated will help you understand in aggregate what's driving the attrition over time, right? And sometimes it's just keeping people uh, involved in the community over time. Keep emailing them, uh, keep attempting to have the conversation. And, uh, you know, maybe somebody's had a life event, they had a child, they moved, they lost a job, whatever that might be, all things that we know that lead to uh, to last participation, and uh, perhaps when the time is right, they'll be able to uh, log back in and to uh, and to participate in the future too. Great. Anything to add there, Lisa? I know it's not. Um... Yeah, I do. I have I have some commentary around that. I mean, I know you know from working with you guys and helping to be a, a, a sample supplier for you for a number of years. I know that the fuel cycle platform is actually really great about long-term retention, so it's not necessarily an issue that you're facing <laughs> day in and day out in terms of uh, lapsed users, um, but it's a huge problem across the industry. Uh, most people don't actually actively unsubscribe. They just sort of fall asleep at the wheel and, and leave. Um, and so, you know, I think you've got to get real with why people are leaving, and I think definitely getting some cooperation on um, satisfaction, panel satisfaction is key. So like the team and I over at Innovate, we run a panel stat survey that's constantly changing um, every week or so, um, asking them questions about new things that we're trying out, trying to get feedback from them uh, on various things. And I think that that's important. And then sharing out that, hey, we conducted the survey and here's what you told us and here's what we're going to do moving forward to make your experience better. Um, I think that really helps to stave off 
the lapse rate or high attrition rate that we do see you know, in the industry itself. But I think there comes a time too where if you've done enough damage, it's like trying to get that boyfriend, ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend back with you. Sometimes there's just been a lot of water that's gone under the bridge and that respondent's not going to come back and you can only learn from it moving forward so that future recruits that you bring into your community or your panel are treated better, right? Um, and hopefully are around much longer. Yeah, definitely. Wonderful, thank you. Well, I had another question from Ryan come in and he's asking, do you have any tips for continuing the panel member's journey, for example, reducing churn when you have limited resources for content creation? I think maybe this is best for Rick to start off with. Mm -hmm. When you have limited resources for content creation. You know, I think, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, sure, yes and no. Um, I think that one of the things that's important for a community to uh, be su successful long term is to uh, continue engaging with community members. And so, you know, if you have limited resources, I would suggest en engaging, uh, you know, another organization, maybe like our professional services group, to help with that that long term, um, you know, that long term content creation and, and value creation for community members. You know, one of the things that uh, I know from both my my past, you know, working in, in the panel space and also here at Fuel Cycle, working in communities is, uh, you know, uh, I, I grew up on a farm in, in Central California, so what I like to say is I know that panels and communities are, are like horses. They like to be exercised, right? And so uh, continuing to reach out and having new information for them um, and new ways to participate is an important component of keeping a, a community active and vibrant over time. Mm -hmm. I, I agree 100 percent and and I have an analogy too we're full of analogies today I often refer to it as the rotten strawberry effect if you don't pick that strawberry it's gonna rot on the vine and respondents are the same way um, I think there's always this fear in the space that like overutilization is gonna kill the panel but really most panels die or generate high levels of attrition due to underutilization and I've experienced firsthand in a, in a previous company so um, I think it's it's really key to figure out ways that you can engage respondents and get creative, um, you know, whether it's leveraging other resources that you have internally to you um, or, you know, doing something as simple as a blog, you know, having a voice and letting know, letting respondents know that it's not just this kind of survey experience that they're going to get a chance to interact with you. Um, or, you know, I guess get to the point where you just have to accept that you're going to have a higher attrition rate than what you could if you made the investment to to put some content um, together. Yeah, and, and also, I mean, look for additional resources inside your organization. Uh, you know, one of the uh, uh, B2B uh, community that we worked with, uh, or we, we continue to work with, they, they were have a small insights team, and they needed additional content. And so they worked with, uh, you know, the, the rest of the marketing and PR team uh, to develop content that was specific for the community. They did things like release white papers earlier uh, in the community than, than publicly. Um, and that was a great way to provide like content over time is working with other, you know, other stakeholders uh, in the community success too. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great idea. And also, you know, your respondents can be great content generators as well, depending on how you form your, your community. So kind of reaching out to your super users or people that are coming back time and time again, they have a voice and they love to share it. And, you know, we've even leveraged individuals that participate in our panel to kind of provide a, a new perspective. And we've had panelists blog before. Um, mm -hmm. So there's really a lot of creative things that you can do that makes the respondent feel like the lights are on and people are listening that really don't cost a lot of money or take a lot of time. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Thank you, Lisa and Rick. Those are great actionable items. Uh, so I have another question that came in from, I think it's Luca. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, do you have experience with incentive acceptance in different cultures? And are certain types of incentives absolutely not advisable? Um, Lisa, why don't you take that first? Well, I mean, from my experience, I found that mo most cultures um, appreciate um, a, a, an incentive or some some type of, of gift. Um, and so I haven't really found that, that there's a particular geo or country that we would, you know, excuse. I think the important thing to remember is that you're offering things that are relevant. Um, so I've seen some panels out there that will offer rewards that are only redeemable in the U.S., but are being offered in the U.K. And that makes no sense. 
um, you have to offer rewards that are relevant for the particular geo that you are engaging. And I think offering a wide variety and recognizing that, again, these are human beings, they all have different likes and dislikes. And so variety is really the spice of life here. So offering different types of rewards that are going to appeal to the various groups that reside within your panel or your community, I think is really important as well. Um, and then I also think too, you know, for some of the other more developing markets, you know, really keeping in mind that the cost of the US dollar is very different um, in relation to their own currency. And so you don't want to over incentivize users. Um, so if you're offering, you know, two dollars or three dollars or the equivalent thereof in virtual currency in the U.S. for a consumer study, that's a whole lot of money in in other developing markets in the world, and it can actually produce some negative behaviors. So having a system that's smart enough to make those correlations and offer something that's appropriate for the time and the energy that you're asking respondents to invest is also something really important to think about. Yeah, res respondent choice is, is key for us. Um, <clears throat> we know that uh, pretty much uh, every culture appreciates uh, incentives, uh, but giving respondents choice uh, is, is always going to be like a, a, a predictor of respondent satisfaction too. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you guys. We had another question come in from Jamie. How do you manage such a large pool of incentives? Automatically. <laughs> uh, that's, that's what I would say, or programmatically, uh, more correctly. Um, so I'm, I know uh, Lisa and her team have programmatic incentive management on their side, and that's something that we've integrated into our platform is to do it programmatically so we can kind of uh, uh, not set it and forget it, but set it and monitor it um, within uh, each individual community on, on our side. Yeah, I, I can't imagine doing it any other way than, uh, you know, programmatically. But, you know, I think it's important, too, to, you know, either formulate your own help desk team or, in your case, Rick, leverage your full service department to help manage respondent queries related to incentive fulfillment. Um, because, you know, they've worked really hard to get there, and once they make it to that redemption level and cash out their reward, we don't want to keep them waiting. Um, and unfortunately, you know, some of the operational components can be challenging. I've seen this. I've, I've read about it online among other panels. And that, that problem has to be cured. You know, you can't have people waiting to receive something they've worked so hard for. So, you know, the key is doing it programmatically um, so that it, it runs and, uh, and people are happy. Definitely. Great. We have another question from Julie, and I think this is um, going to be for you, Lisa. Do you have any advice on how to persuade clients to increase incentive amounts for their studies? Mm. It's a great question. Um, I mean, I know there's some R&R out there that kind of shows to the importance of, of incentivization, so I think that would be maybe something to share. Um, and if we follow up after the webinar, I can, I can pull together some some information for you, um, but you know clearly I think there's a direct correlation. There's been a lot of R and R done on it, um, and I think I would I would point to that fact, um, especially if they're looking to build an ongoing community because communities are an investment, and if you want to get the most return on, the, you know the greatest ROI on your investment, you really need to build the system the right way. Um, and I think you know if it's an ongoing longitudinal community, you know sharing that data back. So I'll give you an example. At a previous company, um, the CFO was putting a tremendous amount of pressure on me to reduce incentives, and begrudgingly, I, I did it. Um, but it had a direct impact on overall response rates, overall lifetime completion, uh, and overall uh, long-term retention of the panel. And so sharing that data back with him, I think definitely gave him some new insight, because I think the instinct is to sort of cut there first. Um, and again, it, it helps you sort of short term, but long term it actually has a much more negative impact and you'll finish up spending a lot much, you know, a lot, lot more money recruiting into your panel to offset the loss that you've generated by your own doing. I don't know, Rick, do you have to have other thoughts on that? No, just that there's a, a significant, significant amount of literature on this topic and I would, uh, you know, either Lisa or I or both of us can, can help guide you in the right direction, um, but there is been a lot of research done on this and the effect of uh, incentives on response rates and, and overall health um, of a community or panel. So uh, happy to help with that in the future. 
Great. We have another question from Philip who asks, have you seen any large-scale studies showing how often respondents need to be active over the course of the year to avoid withering on the vine? Rick, mm. do you want to take this first? So, <laughs> good question. So, when we look at our own data, uh, you know, for us it's really about continuing outreach to respondents to keep them participating over time, right? So, um, you know, I don't think that there's a hard and fast rule around how many times that they need to participate, but maybe the, the variable that we should look at is how often we need to communicate with respondents. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, our guidance is typically uh, once every week or two uh, to have like an outbound communication to, to respondents or to community members um, in order to keep them engaged over time. Um, although in some cases, you know, once a month, uh, I would say would, would be like the bare minimum to, to do that. Um, and really like, you know, I think we can expect res respondents to, to participate, um, not every time that we have an outbound communication to them, but uh, you know, our, our guidance is gonna be more around uh, how frequently we, we communicate to them than how frequently they should log in, given that we have communication in our control and not the others. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I mean, I agree with everything you said there, Rick. And I think, too, you know, and I wonder as well from a community standpoint, um, it could be challenging because, you know, some of the communities you have are specific to one brand, one sort of topic area. But I found from my own personal experience that having some survey variation and just variation in content um, is really important to keeping people engaged long term as well. Great. Well, um, I, I think this is going to be our last question just because we're getting close to the hour and I just want to be respectful of everybody's time. So, um, But we will follow up with any of the open questions that we didn't get to answer today um, afterwards. But I have the last question, and again, I'm sorry if I mispronounce this name from Kirill. Um, and so they ask, what are the best tactics to get the client to simplify or quantify their survey? Lisa, why don't you take this one away? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question, and it's it's very challenging. I think I had mentioned earlier that a lot of times when you're formulating that survey, you're dealing with multiple parties, various constituents within the organization that all have a stake in the survey, and it can be a, a bit unwieldy to manage. And I think the key is about transparency and about education. Having webinars like this to talk about these topics, doing research on reach and research on research, and sharing that data, and really making um, a clear point about why it's important to, you know, de develop a shorter, you know, survey, why it's important to have a mobile first strategy, you know, what are you missing out on when you make some of these missteps. So for example, <clears throat> if you design a survey that's not catered to the mobile audience, and yet you're looking to reach moms, you know, if it's a desktop only study, you could, you could really worry about representation. We also know that certain key um, ethnicities such as Hispanics are, are very active on their mobile devices. Um, millennials as well and so excluding those audiences from your research data does not make any sense and so I think that those are real strong selling points to have those conversations which I know can be very tough I've done it myself with clients about you know the optimal approach to creating a really great design that's going to help you achieve your research objectives and also ensure that you're casting the widest most representative net that you possibly can yeah and just the need to keep like to uh, to spread your net wide is really key. If it, if it works on mobile, it's going to work on desktop. If it works on desktop, that doesn't guarantee it's going to work on mobile. And so I think, uh, you know, looking at, uh, you know, internally, uh, we look at uh, cooperation rates inside the survey to <clears throat> see how, you know, uh, what the drop-off rates are for, for people by device type. And, uh, you know, if you have a poor survey design, the, the mobile drop-off rate is going to be significantly higher. And so I would look at that historical data and also look to some of the, the things that the, uh, you know, uh, that, that some of our industry organizations have put out on this topic because I think there's a, a wealth of information out there that can help provide that guidance. Well, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Lisa. This was so informative, and you guys shared so many actionable techniques and tips. 
to really start making the respondent experience um, great again um, so that we can build a relationship rather than a transactional experience. So thank you guys so much. And I just went ahead and forwarded um, to our last slide here so you can see the contact information for both Lisa and Rick. So like I mentioned before, um, you guys were a great audience, very engaged. There was lots of questions and unfortunately we just didn't have time to go through, um, you know, to answer all of them today, but we will follow up with answers directly after this webinar. Um, so yeah, thank you guys.